What's up, everybody? My name is Jordan Farmer. This is the Uncommon Ground Podcast, Episode 5. And today, we're going to be tackling a very fun topic, solving global warming or climate change, whatever term you want to call it. Um, And on that note, I'm going to get into a little bit of substance. The reason why climate change sometimes is the better term than global warming, even though global warming is the immediate issue that we have, ice ages happen. Our fear with global warming or the standard narrative of the fear around global warming is that uh, we will have the opposite of an ice age, which temperature goes down and up, so it makes sense that it can happen. They're afraid that an extreme increase in temperatures will lead to crazy weather that will be both bad for human and uh, animal life and plant life to flourish sort of in a stable way or in a uh, renewable way. Um, So... We need to understand that both, it can happen, hypothetically we could have this extreme weather event that goes um, up in temperature, but we also know that we can have ice ages and extreme cooling, so we need to be prepared for both of those eventualities going forward, and we need to understand the top 10 to 50, or whatever that makes up like 90% of the the contributing forces. to global temperature. We need to understand what contributes to that the most and how we can sort of gauge that um, cooperating with international partners. Um, So I'm going to throw you a couple curveballs first. Um, One which is an observation and another which is a policy and then both of those will play back into um, back into solving global warming at the end of this podcast. The first curveball is uh, just the observation that because of all the money that has been made that's been saved in all time by rich people, poor people, whoever, and because of all the money that's in liquid assets like stocks and stuff, and all the money that is in uh, that is being pumped into the system by the Federal Reserve, that means that adds up in totality to an insane amount of capital and it will always be the case that that amount of capital that exists outside government budgets far 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 exceeds the the capital within government budgets so the only time it makes sense to do to spend sort of to do hard spending uh with a government budget is when you have to do direct stimulus or when you have to invest in something that's actually good or directly good for the people. But as much as you can avoid that and have the private sector capital pool be paying for it or the investment sort of being driven that way, um, you should want to do that as much as possible. So <clears throat> because you're going to be pooling from a much bigger uh, capital pool and you're going to be having people that actually know how to deploy that capital effectively be in charge of the of the response whenever you can do that it's not always the right way to go but keep that in mind second point opportunity zones opportunity zones in the 2017 tax bill were created or there's a provision that created them that allowed governors to designate economically underserved areas within their within their states as opportunity zones and what would happen once this designation occurred was that any investment within that area that was put in and held for 10 years, so long-term investments, job-creating investments, any investments that were made in that area long-term would <clears throat> uh, be capital gains uh, tax-free or exempt. They're, they would get some sort of a capital gains tax reduction for that. What this creates is a pri- decentralized private sector response that is guided by a centralized action by the government. So it's a perfect moderate policy and a perfect hybrid between the traditional free market policy and the traditional bureaucratic style government policy. This is a hybrid where it's allowing the where it's the a centralized action guiding a decentralized response or the decentralized response from a decentralized system. So there's an endless amount of capital outside of uh, government budgets and this type of policy can be very, very effective. Keep that in mind. Okay, now the actual discussion about global warming as it stands now. First and foremost, it centers around CO2 emissions going into the atmosphere and increased increased atmospheric CO2 levels and specifically man the uh, man's portion of that, like the portion of that that man is contributing to 
increase CO2 levels in the atmosphere. <clears throat> and it's focused on, uh, in terms of solutions, focused on reducing man-made or man, uh, man-made CO2 emissions, trying to reduce those in order to create a CO2 balance in the atmosphere and, and slow down this increase in um, global warming that is caused by CO2, increased CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Now, global temperatures by themselves fluctuate. There is a natural carbon cycle. All that actually has some merit to it, but and we were two degrees higher 50,000 years ago or so, but the problem is not temperatures in and of themselves. It's climate change. It's the environment being manipulated by differences in the atmosphere. The levels that we currently have of CO2 levels in the atmosphere have not been seen, or at least have not been documented according to our scientists. It hasn't been on this planet for 100 million years. We haven't had levels at this at this rate, which is over 400 uh, parts per million, I think. Um, we haven't had levels this high in 100 million years. So we're dealing with something that is absolutely different than just the temperature issue. So getting hung up on the carbon cycle or the temperature issue, uh, those are pitfalls, but those are not necessarily the actual issue. Um, <clears throat> but I disagree with the focus on man-made uh, CO2 emissions, and I disagree with the focus on reducing those as the solution. That's half the game. The other half of the game is the longest environmental issue that we've ever had, deforestation. Not just deforestation for its own sake, but plant life in, in forests obviously has immense value and we find drugs and all sorts of life-saving things and there's all kinds of cool species within various you know natural domains. So we want lots of forest and, and once people get, uh, once a country gets to about $4,000 in GDP per capita, they start to actually like just it's almost like a, a law where once people are that rich they actually care about the environment that once they hit that level then they have uh, much more concern you start seeing environmental pol environmental policies pop up and as people can afford to care about the environment they do and you see this reduction so economic prosperity is a tool as well but that's that's a different discussion i put up a video about fixing the economy watch that Anywho, so half of the problem is deforestation, uh, which means that we're, di we're diminishing Mother Nature's capacity to absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere while we're, ex while we're creating an excess at the same time through our own means. So we're tilting the scales on uh, both directions. <clears throat> so in order to solve this, uh, I have a few uh, stats for you just to sort of offer some perspective. How much of the overall amount of carbon dioxide that gets emitted into the atmosphere is man-made versus the total amount? And of the amount that gets absorbed in from the atmosphere, what's that uh, percentage as well? Well, the answer to both in the first case is 5.2%, and in the second case is 5.06%, which means of if you had 20 parts that were all the CO2 going into the atmosphere or all the CO2 being absorbed in the atmosphere, one of those 20 chunks would be what we're doing. So we are barely on the board as a player, but that doesn't mean that the imbalance isn't still our fault, and it doesn't mean that the imbalance isn't still a problem. But focusing on CO2 emissions and crushing the energy industry and crushing the ener energy industry for foreign company or foreign countries as well because one of the fundamental aspects of cost of living is your energy costs everyone gets that PG&E bill or whatever every month um, crushing our energy industry just to marginally reduce even if you were in the Paris Climate Accord or any of that you're only marginally reducing our CO2 emissions that are going into the atmosphere. And even if you reduced it by 100%, you would still be in a situation where the natural CO2 that's being emitted into the atmosphere is accelerating because the warmth creates increased ocean uh, temperatures, which increases the, uh, the amount of, it increases the amount of uh, CO2 that's being emitted by the oceans into the atmosphere. If we reduced our CO2 emissions 100%, we would create a small deficit um, that would slowly work on the problem, but it would come at an insane cost, both in terms of actual cost and an opportunity cost, or the money we won't have, the riches we won't have, the economic prosperity we won't have. 
and it's unnecessary. That's the main thing. That's the driving point I want to bring home to you is it's completely unnecessary to destroy the energy, the fossil fuel energy industry for solving global warming because deforestation, or I'm sorry, reforestation or increasing mother nature's ability to absorb the CO2 from the atmosphere by 5% or, or uh, yeah, by 5% will get rid of the CO2 uh, surplus that we have currently in the atmosphere that's increasing the levels year over year. It's about 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year uh, compared to about 800 that's the natural going into natural emission rate and natural absorption rate for mother nature. It's 800 and 800 and we're 40. So that's those are rough numbers, but that's essentially the scale. So um, if we just marginally increase mother nature's absorption rate, we will solve the issue long term and eventually we'll end up with too little carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we'll have to increase our fossil fuel consumption or find some other mechanism to balance it once we do this. But uh, reforestation is the, is the deal and we only need to increase the absorption rate by about 5% in order to solve this issue, uh, at least to stop the increase. And then once we go beyond 5%, we'll decrease uh, atmospheric CO2 levels. Now. How do we do this reforestation in the smartest way possible instead of just spending government money on planting trees? First off, how much reforestation would it take in terms of real land that we're talking about? Where would we find this land? And um, how much would it cost to plant all those trees? So the answers to this are uh, um, that of the total land that is used by human beings about half is this is off the top of my head these are not numbers i recently looked up but is about half agriculture but these are the concrete numbers in order to create enough trees and the the average was about 20 trees per acre because you got to consider like low tree land low den low tree density land height tree density land in combination but it would take 1.4 billion acres of forest to uh stop the gap or to fill in the surplus uh, or sorry it would take 1.4 billion acres of forest to absorb the sur carbon surplus we currently have and then once we go beyond that we start reversing the trend so that represents about 13 percent i'm sorry no that represents 10.9 percent of total agricultural land so if we decrease our current land agricultural land use by 11 or 10.9 percent, that would solve the problem, or at least you know that would get us where we need to go. And then as we go beyond that, um, as we go beyond that, we'll start to reverse the trend. So agriculture is the main culprit here. We've we've used an insane, insane amount of Earth's surface with agriculture, and that's been the main contributor to deforestation. But obviously we need to feed people. I have said in previous videos that I do not respect whatsoever the notion that we have too many people on the planet, the planet's overpopulated, because that has the obvious implication that we need to get rid of some people. I don't believe that. And also, um, we can feed them. We have enough food. It's just that various uh, markets that produce food aren't necessarily as efficient as it could be. But also, how we solve this issue with, of reforestation and how we solve the agriculture issue is using that mechanism for opportunity zones or um, a capital gains tax exemption for the 3D farming industry as a whole. Any, any crops, any edible crops by animals or any edible crops by human beings that are grown in a warehouse or 3D environment will uh, should get if, and if the investments in that sector are held for, I would do two years so that you're encouraging much more risky, much more R&D heavy um, type of uh, investments, or you just do ongoing because you just want people to pour money into that sector and grow it, um, then you can just do it ongoing. It doesn't really matter. You could just say full capital gains tax exemption for the 3D farming industry. But if we just go from an average of one level and one number of crops per acre to two or double the crop yield per acre that reduces our agricultural land by 50 percent we only need like 11 to, to stop the 
bleeding and then you know 15% to solve the problem over uh, 20 years so we can get there much faster using this policy than even necessary so we got to be careful and we got to make sure we're watching this on the other end but that policy a capital gains tax exemption for however many years for the 3d farming industry alone will solve global warming because not only will it develop that technology here and uh, increase its effectiveness but by developing the technology faster here once that becomes the most efficient way to farm it will be adopted across the planet because it's the most efficient way to do business and anytime you can make it so that the super capitalists or the psycho capitalists are incentivized to do what the hippies want you're solving an environmental problem with the best people suited to solve it so that's the policy that's the solution and the, because the capital pool outside of government budgets is the biggest this will actually get it done because planting you know 20 tree you know planting 30 billion trees is pretty expensive but we could just let the private sector pay for it through this mechanism so have a great one god bless peace out